Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we, uh, as far as I know, this will be the last message that I preach in front of most of you for quite a while. So you help me preach tonight. Amen. And uh, we are supposed to, in the morning, head down for Allentown. We're scheduled to preach there over the weekend. And then we are uh, planning on being down there for the camp meeting. The Allentown, well, they call it fellowship meeting. I call it camp meeting. Allentown this coming week. And uh, I sure do enjoy going there. Amen. I always get blessed going down to the March meeting at Allentown. So you all remember and be praying for it and everything. And my father-in-law, Brother Miller, what they've done is they've started having so many people come down and the meeting at the campground doesn't actually start until Tuesday night. So several of the churches down there have started having a Monday or Tuesday morning, not Tuesday night, started having a Monday night fellowship meeting, included Brother Russell McDonald, who's one of my personal favorites, and Brother Miller is going to be preaching Brother McDonald's fellowship meeting Monday night. So, Lord's willing, we'll be down there for that too. All right, let's go to the book of Luke and the story, or the chapter at least, at least the beginning of the chapter, but that's not where we're reading from, that everybody reads from almost every year, Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2. Amen. Let's start at verse number 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year, speaking of Jesus' parents, went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child, Jesus, tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolks and acquaintance. How far did they go? A one-day journey. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Amen. If it be all right to take a title tonight, I want to take for a title, One Day Gone, Three Days Getting Back. One Day Gone, Three Days Getting Back. All right, let's all pray. Jesus, I ask you, Lord, to help me tonight, Lord. Help me, Lord, to preach, Lord. Give me the right spirit, Lord. Give me the right words to say, Lord. Move in our altars tonight, Lord. Just have your way, Lord. Not my will be done, Lord, but thy will be done, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody, everybody said amen. amen. I tell you what, you all are getting better and better at that. All right. Well, let me share with you a little story. Five years ago this week, if, if I'm getting a, a time right, my wife, I'm sure, can straighten the time up if I'm not, we went down to Allentown, we had our truck and our fifth wheel, and we went down there for the camp meeting. Well, we went down on Monday, so I backed that trailer between the other trailers, it was all already parked there, and I unhooked my truck and everything, and anyway, I got done just in time that everybody was leaving, going to the different fellowship meetings down there. All the people parked on the campgrounds was leaving, going to the fellowship meetings. So I went to the trailer and I said, Melissa, hey, they're all getting ready to leave and go to different fellowship meetings. One of them's just five or ten minutes from here. Let's me and you go. And she said, well, Doug, if you know anything about travel trailers, there's a lot of packing and unpacking to do every time you move it so nothing gets broken and you have to clean up. She said, I have a lot to do in here you go ahead. So I went. Well, I as soon as the preacher got done preaching, I believe Brother Don Rich was preaching where I went. And as soon as I got as soon as he got done preaching and they made the altar service, I started thinking, well, I might just stay and help Melissa do all that work. So I better get out of here and go over there and help her do the work. So I went ahead and left. Well, we got down there, and most of you already know this, 
Melissa's first cousin is Darlene Blanton. So Paul and Darlene, there was one trailer between our trailer and Paul and Darlene's trailer. Well, let me let you in on one of my wife's faults back then. My wife, she's shaking her head no, but I'm going to tell you anyway. My wife, I remember one time we was parked at Springdale Road at the home church there, and I was out working on my truck, and my wife was in the trailer, and Caleb was just born in October, so he was still small enough to be in a baby bed. And so he was asleep, she had him in the baby bed, and she went on into the church to use the telephone and left him by himself asleep in the baby bed in the trailer. I thought, well, that's not good. So I went in there and told her, I said, Melissa, you didn't even tell me. If I hadn't have seen you, what if I'd have left to go get something and come, and while I was gone, somebody else would have came and that trailer unlocked and the baby in there asleep, somebody would have took the baby and then what would you have done? Well, she didn't think nothing of it. And then it happened again. I don't remember where, but somewhere else where we was parked. And I remember I was out working on the truck, and I saw her go in the church, and she went in there to play the piano and sing, and left the baby asleep in the baby bed. So anyway, I came back from the service a little bit earlier than she expected. I walked in the fifth wheel. Melissa! Melissa! She wasn't in there. So I figured I knew where she went. She probably had went over to that trailer over there where her cousin Darlene was to talk to her a few minutes. So anyway, as I started to walk out of the trailer, I looked up to the top of the fifth wheel, and there laid Caleb asleep in the baby bed. Well, I thought, good time to teach her a lesson. So I just went up there, and I picked Caleb up, and I put him in the pickup truck, and I left. I didn't tell her, and I left with the baby. So I was gone, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And as I pulled back in the campgrounds, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. You go around the church, back there with the trailer's park. And as I came around that church, it was unbelievable what I seen. There must have been 50 grown men out there with flashlights going, And I pulled around there and I looked and I rolled my window down and I heard what they was hollering and I thought, oh no. I might have took this one a little too far. So I pulled around there and here come Paul Blanton and you all know Paul. He just runs as hard as he can. He runs up, he puts his head in the truck. Oh, Doug, Doug, listen, Missy's over there. You need to go over there. She's really upset. She's got something to tell you. I said, what's wrong, Paul? He said, I can't tell you, Doug. I think maybe this, maybe your wife ought to tell you this one. And he was just so upset, and he turned around and ran back into the woods hollering for Caleb. So I pulled my truck around, and my wife saw me pull up in the truck, and she come running over there. And let me tell you what she did, folks. She dropped to the ground, fell on the ground on her knees, bawling and screaming, Oh, Doug, you're going to kill me. You're going to kill me, Doug. Oh, Doug, I'm so sorry. I said, honey, what is wrong? Caleb was asleep right next to me. Had his head in my lap. I said, what is wrong, Missy? She said, Caleb is gone. I've lost him. I said, honey, he's right here in the truck. He's asleep. She jumped up. Didn't even cross her mind that I had done it on purpose. And now, for most people, this might be a surprise for all the, if you was out there looking in that fight with a flashlight, this is probably a surprise to you. So anyway, she got in the truck and picked Caleb up and started hugging him and crying her eyes out. Oh, Caleb, I thought I had lost you, Caleb. I said, well, honey, I came back and I just wanted to go up the road there and I just took him with me. What's the big deal? Doc, I thought somebody had kidnapped him. Oh, and she was crying her eyes out. Well, let me tell you, the rest of the night, she never did cross her mind that maybe it was on purpose. The next day, several days later, in the fifth wheel, Missy, I remember I was sitting there on the couch, and she come in the fifth wheel, and she said, I want to ask you something. I said, okay. She said, did you do that to me on purpose with Caleb? On purpose? I didn't lie. I just acted like, I had no idea what she was talking about. On purpose? Honey, 
what are you talking about? She said, did you come and get him on purpose and didn't tell me, thinking I would get upset? Did you do that to me on purpose? I said, honey, I told you I just went up the road and I took him with me. What are you talking about? Well, after a few days, I started feeling bad enough over it. And she was crying day after day after day. I almost lost him. I'm so glad you're still alive, Caleb. I love you. Finally, I said, okay, Missy. I thought I'd just teach you a lesson. So I came and took Caleb on purpose and didn't tell you. Just to teach you a lesson. Well, you talking about teaching her a lesson, that taught her a lesson. It taught me a lesson, too. <laughs> it taught her a lesson. Don't leave your baby asleep in the baby bed in the trailer and, and think you're going to go over a couple trailers over. It taught me a lesson. Don't try to teach your wife lessons. <laughs> I mean to tell you, when I confess my faults to her, you know, I think the Bible says something about it. It was good to confess your faults. I confessed that one to her. It wasn't very good. I got the cold shoulder for many, many days afterwards. Then everything that would happen, the first thing she would start saying and thinking now, no matter what it was, no matter what bad thing happened, she'd say, yeah, did you do that too on purpose? Yeah, did you, what did you have to do with it? I'm like, honey, honestly, I didn't have anything to do with that. Well, and let me tell you, that has been five years ago, and Caleb is five years old now, and it still comes up if she thinks I'm up to something. What are you going to do? Take one of my kids and hide them? So, I just want to publicly say, I learned my lesson, and Melissa, I have no intention of ever doing that again. Praise the Lord. And Melissa said, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. All right, all right. In this book that, of Luke, chapter number two, we read the story of Joseph and Mary, and it was the time of year that they would make a trip to Jerusalem, as they did for the Feast of the Passover, every year they would make the trip to Jerusalem. Well, now from what I have read about this trip, it was something that was done annually, and it was something that was done as a big thing with everybody that made that trip. In other words, they hooked all of their uh, uh, animals, whatever they used, and their buggies, whatever they pulled, and then a bunch of them went. So it was a big trip. So, when you went, you went with your whole family, and not just your spouse and your children, but with your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins. A large amount of people together would go. And when you got there, one of the great things about it was you would try to take as little as you could with you and then bring back as much as you could because there was things that you couldn't get at Nazareth that you could get at Jerusalem. It was a big city. You could go there and take care of getting supplies and try to get enough to last you until the next year. So, when you got there, there was a lot of work to do as far as trying to get everything together. So anyway, whatever it was that was the problem, now, I would say that what Melissa felt when she walked in that fifth wheel, and I don't know what she said, but whatever she said, when she walked in that fifth wheel and realized that Caleb was not in there, that feeling that made her run through the campgrounds and get all those men out there with their flashlights hollering looking for Caleb, and then whatever the feeling it was, that made her run to my truck and fall on the ground and cry her eyes out, whatever that feeling was, that great love and heartbreak, I think that is probably very much like what Mary felt. They had went a day's journey, and they just supposed him to be there. So I don't know what it was. Something might have happened that Mary needed Jesus. She might have said, Jesus! Hey, Jesus! no answer. And she might have said, Joseph, get Jesus. Jesus! He isn't in here. Well, he's probably with some of our kins, folks. He's probably with some of our friends. He's probably back there, you know, with the so-and-sos. Just go back there and check. They checked. They could not find him. He was nowhere 
with them. And so they turned around and headed back toward Jerusalem to find him. Now, I am thinking, now, you know, uh, I was a full-time evangelist for three years or so, and then I pastor for three years. So I didn't get to be in the greater Cincinnati area very much for several years. And you know, I love my mom and dad and my family. I miss them. And I had made such good friends, all of my buddies. I grew up there at Springdale Road and all the boys that I grew up with and the girls I grew up with and now they're all married with kids of their own. As a matter of fact, one of them helped me sing here tonight, Brother Terry Whitney and him's been friends our whole entire life. Well, let me tell you, I miss them. I really did. And you know what? When we would come home, we would usually, we'd have church on Wednesday and Saturday, or Sunday and Wednesday, so either way, that only left you very little time to be here, make the trip, and then visit, and head back home, didn't give you much time to visit. And I tell you what, when we would come home, and we would only have two days, we would hit the road, and hit it hard and fast. We would visit as many people as we could during that time. We would go here and go there and go there and go here or whatever because I just missed them. And let me tell you, when you get to be with your acquaintance and your kinsfolks that you don't get to be with every day, if you really love them, it'll, you'll learn that it's very important to you and it may take up some of your time. So I can just imagine now, Joseph and Mary is there with all their kinsfolks and their friends, and I can just imagine that every little bit, Joseph just wants to walk back through all the wagons or whatever it was and just talk and say hello and meet with everybody. And then when they get to Jerusalem, I imagine, you know, they was there for purpose and they had a lot of things to do. But I am sure that he wanted to spend as much time as he could with his buddies. Sure. And Mary too, with her family and with her friends. Well, when they got ready to leave, they left. The most important possession, the most important thing that they brought with them was their little boy. And they got so busy, perhaps one of the things was visiting and talking and kidding around and enjoying and hugging necks and saying, Hey, I ain't seen you since last year. How you doing? Man, look at that boy. Boy, that guy's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, they got so busy that they forgot and left that very important possession back at Jerusalem. Or could it have been that, you know, it was a very important thing to get as many supplies as you can, and so, you know, there's just things back at Nazareth that you can't get, and you've earned the money, and there was certainly no sin in going to Jerusalem and spending it, and so there was a lot of things that they needed to get. So they spent such time trying to get everything and going to this store and that store, maybe when they got ready to leave and Joseph said, all right, Mary, are you ready to go? She might have said, oh, Joseph, I just need to run over here just for a couple minutes. There's something else I need to get. <laughs> and so whatever it was, it might have been the busyness as far as trying to get everything they needed supply-wise that they left. They apparently had all the supplies they needed, but they left the most important possession back at Jerusalem. They left Jesus in Jerusalem. Or could it have been, now, if I understand history right and understand everything just right, when they got there, they didn't have any Super 8s or Holiday Inns. You do know what a Super 8 and Holiday Inn is, don't you? That's where you can just get on the road and go as long as you want to, and when you get ready to stop, stop and walk in, pay a little money, and lay down on a big, nice, comfortable bed. And you know what? You know why I like it? You don't even have to clean up when you get ready to leave. All you have to do is just leave. They'll come and clean it up. Hey, let me tell you, you can mess that bed up and mess that room up as much as you want to, and then you get ready to leave, just leave. They don't mind. Well, in this trip, there was no Super 8s or Holiday Inns. So they wasn't staying at Super 8s and Holiday Inns. If I understand right, the way it was done was they would take 
tents and so forth to stay in. So when they got there, they had to set up their tents and get out all of their bedding and unpack, if you will, in order to have somewhere to stay. And then when they got ready to leave, there was a lot of work to do to try to get everything repacked and get everything loaded back up. So there was a lot of work to do that made them very busy. But they left the most important possession in their life in Jerusalem. Amen? So let me tell you something, friends. I believe that I know here that we have people here that have lost children to sickness, to death, or whatever. I know that death is a terrible thing to lose a child to. And I know if you have ever lost a child to death, it is a very hard thing to go through. And I am sure that everybody else here, hopefully, has lost their kids if they've been a mom or dad for several years, long enough, to a thing called matrimony. So, it's still a sad thing to lose your child, even to weddings. You know, most weddings I go to and I sit there and look at them moms, don't ask me, I'm not a mom, but moms usually cry at weddings because they think they're losing their babies. Well, let me tell you, but you can live on even when your kids get married. When your kids are gone, when you lose one of your children to matrimony or whatever the situation might be, you can still go on and you can still make it. But the most important thing that you have that you better make sure you don't lose for any reason is Jesus. And the thing about Jesus is there are many, many people in this world that is going on. They've left him, but they just supposing him to be in the midst. Yeah. Did you catch that? Right. Joseph and Mary just supposed that he was in the midst. They didn't, before they left, go back and make sure that he was still there. They just figured, he's always here. Ah, he's with us. He'll be with us. Let's go. Come on. They just supposed that when they got ready to leave, Jesus would get in and go with them. Well, I feel like there's a lot of people in this world right now that just supposed Jesus would go with them. That just supposed that he would be in their midst. Because he always was before. Why wouldn't he be now? And they didn't make sure that they still had Jesus. The worst thing that can happen to you, friend, is not come back to the fifth wheel and think that Oh no, my baby's gone. What in the world has happened? Which Melissa can tell you more about that. The worst thing that can happen to you is to have a problem that you need Jesus. Now, I don't know what the deal was with Mary. Maybe she just wanted to give him lunch. Maybe she needed him to do something for her. And she hollered, Jesus! Come here and reach me this! Jesus! Jesus! And he isn't there. Let me tell you something, friend. One of the worst nightmares that you could ever happen in your life is to have a need to call on Jesus and Him not be there. You can just assume that He will always be there, but I'm here tonight to tell you that He may not be. You better make sure that you've taken Him with you. Amen? Now, let me tell you, Nobody likes fellowship and visiting and anything more than me, and I'm all for fellowship, and you have a beautiful fellowship hall out here, and I believe in that, and I think it's great. This is just a hint for tonight. If all you ladies want to be dismissed and go home and start, ha let's have a dinner out there in the fellowship hall tonight. A big, nice dinner. Well, I believe in fellowship. That's a wonderful thing. Amen? Amen. But fellowship can get you so involved in doing this and doing that and always worry about doing this and that that you leave Jesus. Now let me tell you, I believe that people that go to church together ought to be friends. Don't you? We are spiritually brothers and sisters and I would like to think I have two sisters and a brother I would like in the flesh. I would like to think that we're friends. We're not just brothers and sisters, but we're friends. I would like to think that all of my spiritual brothers and sisters would be friends too. If this is your home church, wherever your home church is, when you go in, 
I believe you ought to be friendly. Amen? In order to have friends, you've got to be friendly. Amen? But, on the other hand, if you come to church just early enough to make sure you can talk to everybody and say hello to everybody and shake everybody's hand and laugh and cut up a little bit and have a wonderful time with everybody, and then, all through service, you have to make sure you're sitting by somebody that you really like, and then after church, you're so busy that you've got to say goodbye to everybody. Be careful. Fellowship is a wonderful thing for your family and friends, but fellowship can get in the way of making sure that Jesus is with you. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So, I also believe that they, while they was in Jerusalem, they was getting many goods. Well, let me tell you, friends, I hope to goodness, I hope to goodness, the way that you have helped us, I hope to goodness, the Lord blesses every one of you with a brand spanking new Cadillac, I mean brand new, and a brand new home. Every one of you. That's wonderful. There's no sin in having a new Cadillac, is there? There's no sin in having a new house, is there? Well, if there's no sin in that, what is my point? My point is that their priority might have been, instead of Jesus, making sure they got Jesus, it might have been that their priorities was making sure they had all their supplies. Friends, when the most important thing in your life becomes making sure you're making enough money and making sure that you've got everything you need in the physical wise, Listen to me, friends. I don't think that we should worry about tomorrow. Let's just put tomorrow in the hands of the ones that knows tomorrow and holds tomorrow and let Jesus take care of tomorrow. Amen? You are wasting your time trying to worry about, oh no, what are we going to do tomorrow? Listen, friend. Just do your best. Pay your tithes. Live for the Lord and do your part spiritually and the Lord will take care of you. Amen? The Lord will meet your needs and take care of you if you live right and do your end of the bargain and, and take care of your tithes and come to church and being faithful and obeying the Lord. The Lord will meet your needs and take care of you. Amen? Amen. 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 So it could have been that their priorities got so messed up that they had to make sure they had all their supplies. And so it could have been that little Mary or Joseph was just running around trying to run and get that last thing that they had to get. Oh yeah, did you get, oh yeah, well, that market is right over there. Run over there and get it. Hurry, quick. We gotta go. It could have been that they were so worried about making sure they had their supplies that it never crossed their mind, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Now, I want you to notice that this thought came to me. It seems to me like if they would have been in the habit of just talking to Jesus as the day went on, they went a whole day's journey. If they would have been talking to Jesus any time during the day, they would have known that he wasn't there. So apparently, they had went a whole day's journey they had packed and left and went a whole day's journey and did not even speak to him. Come on now. Let me tell you something, friends. You better never go a day without speaking to Jesus. You need to make sure every day that he is still with you. If you ever get so busy that you don't have time to talk to Jesus, then friend, you are too busy. If that means you got to quit your job, sell your house, whatever it means, you better do it. If you are too busy to ever talk to Jesus, you are too busy. Amen? Praise the Lord. It is so important that we understand that it is a must that we keep Jesus because friend let me tell you as far as I know I have never been there 
but I have seen how my wife felt when she thought that she had lost her son. Friend, I have been there and seen someone who called for Jesus and he wasn't there. It's a sad, sad thing. There's a young boy who uh, got married and uh, and uh, he uh, was married for, I don't know, maybe a couple years or so. He was backslidden when he got married and, and he just went on his way and didn't worry about it, you know, nothing he needs, nothing, he, he wasn't worried about nothing. And then he caught his wife having a relationship with another man, so they parted ways. And he became extremely sad to the point of a nervous breakdown pretty well. I don't remember exactly how old he was. I would say 22, 23. And I remember very much at Springdale Road, him coming up and praying and crying and crying his eyes out. And me knowing that he wasn't saved and hadn't been saved for several years, he was crying his eyes out, his hands in the air, and he was screaming, Oh, Jesus, please help me. And nothing was happening. He had gotten so busy with, to tell you exactly what it was, he got so busy with playing softball and being a big sports booster, he got so busy worried about what the ball team was doing that he just left Jesus back there somewhere. And he stood there crying and pleading with his hands up in the air, Oh, Jesus! Please help me! And I'll tell you, friend, when I went and stood next to him, put my arm around him while he was crying, I couldn't help but cry too. Not because he had lost his wife. I mean, that made me cry too, because his wife would do something like that. But it made me cry because that boy, who was a friend of mine, I realized that he just supposed that if he ever needed Jesus, all he had to do was close his eyes and cry and say, Oh, Jesus, I need you. And Jesus would be there. Amen? Let me tell you something, friend. Backsliding is a real problem. It's something that really happens. But I'm going to tell you something I have learned about backsliders. And that is this. Most backsliders don't really worry about the future because they figure all they have to do is come and pray and ask the Lord to forgive them. No problem. Let me tell you something, friend. If we sin willfully after that we have known the knowledge of Christ, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You can backslide and get born again and the Lord can forgive you for all of your sins if you pray and if he decides to. 